Why is it important that those relationships get attended to and thought about and reflected upon because of this rather discouraging slide? These are four international studies of what happens to marital happiness when you become a parent. Yeah, I should have warned anybody who's not a parent probably to come in after this slide, but it's too late now. And, <clears throat> but you know, this is the job of the scientist. We've got to know the truth. And I'm going to even point out to you, the, slides, the, slide, the slope starts to head south before the child is born. Okay, that, that third trimester when the entire world is clustered around the mother and the father can't even get in the room, that's what that feels like. And the, he is beginning to wonder, I thought I had something to do with this child. Well, maybe, maybe not. Plato said that mothers are closer to their children than fathers because they are more certain they are their own. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> So the slope's headed in one direction. Sorry, that's the truth. Goes down, the slope is steepest down through toddlerhood, of course, which is the Armageddon of co-parenting. Um, <clears throat> tends to calm down a little bit when the child goes off to preschool or school, and then it goes down again, and we stopped at 14 and a half because we think it's discouraging enough. <clears throat> Um, but if we were to stretch it out to 18 or 19, you'd start to see it sort of calm. It starts to sort of plateau and then sort of slowly edge its way back up. But sorry to say, you never see those halcyon days again. Um, because you're busy sharing your happiness, not with each other, but with a whole bunch of other people uh, who need it and thrive on it. And I don't know, many couples have to decide, you know, was it worth uh, was it worth it for what we have before? And most couples would say, yes, um, it is. <clears throat> so, it's tough, but you're in it together, but you're not exactly on the same page ever. You're in the same book, but you're, you, have different, um, you have different tasks to do in the rearing of children. And that starts right from the beginning, and I'm just going to go through a few of my favorites here. And I'm talking about trends in behavioral differences between mothering and fathering. And I'm using, forgive me, sixth grade English teacher, fathering as a verb. Because biology has a strong predisposition toward a father being connected to his child, but biology does not guarantee that it will happen any more that it, hap it guarantees that it will happen in mothering. So a lot of people can father, including grandfathers, brothers, uncles, and in fact, some of the dimorphisms I'm going to be talking about are quite obvious in gay and lesbian couples, because the roles tend to, there's, there's not enough room at the same end of the spectrum, and so you begin to spread out, and sure enough, you got a good cop and a bad cop. And gender may have something to do with it, but I do not think these are embedded in chromosomes. Preference for activation versus stimulation and soothing. Mothers pick up their babies nine times out of 10. They do it exactly the same way. They bend over the baby and bring the baby up to their, can you hear me or did I just go off? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll stay close then. Baby comes up here. And this is a, I can see some of you going, ah, oh. yes, that's what this is. That's the ah oh position. And it's about safety and protection and being near the mother's heart and the child comforting. But you're not going to see a lot of the world from this position. You're going to see more of the world from this position, which is the way most men will bring their children to their bodies sooner or later. They'll have them out here, and yes, we're doing, we're doing shopping together. He's here. I, I had one dad say, yeah, my kid's sort of my hood ornament. <clears throat> you know, as a therapist, I did not explore that, but <clears throat> I am sharing it with you as a powerful metaphor today, and you all get it. Um, he's proud to have his boy, out, his, his boy or his girl out front. Actually, I think it was a girl. Um, and what about when they do pick them up? 
before they get them here, what they do next is often 90% unpredictable. They may toss the baby up in the air, you know, like the Margaret Mead slide with the baby up here, a very common form. You don't see a lot of mother pictures holding their children up over their heads. And <clears throat> um, at least not if you want to sell something with a picture, you don't have that there. <laughs> so there's a way in which the activation and the stimulation matters to men or fathering figures because they like to have their children activated when they're with them. Let's get ready to experience the world together. I'm going to keep you safe from the things I don't want you exposed to yet in the world. They're both right, but they're different. And, um, and it, I'm, I'm not here to sell one approach or the other, but the fact that they're both woven together, you can start to see how the child's very early experience is enriched. Unpredictable versus predictable and regulating styles. Child's on the floor, mother comes into play, sits down on the floor. Pretty soon there's some education going on, some teaching and learning. And, um, but she's kind of going with, our, with, with the flow to sort of teach a word or two or get a little moral lesson in there somehow. Fathers come in into the day, sit down on the floor. That looks like fun. Now let's do something else. And the teaching that goes on is embedded more in play and teasing than it is in direct instruction. So the fathers like to perturb or excite their children a little bit to activate them and say, deal with me. Eyes here, deal with me. The fathers like the affirmation, and by and large, mostly the children do too unless they've been up for eight hours and are hungry and are ready to throw a fit, then the mother's angry at him for doing it wrong. <clears throat> Preparation for place in the world versus relationships. Real world discipline versus relational discipline. This is an important one because I think families who understand this tend to value each other's approach uh, differently once they understand it's sort of in the tissues. Um, <clears throat> When a child is misbehaving with his mother, um, she is unhappy with the fact that he's not listening to her and he's at the checkout counter and he's throwing the chocolate bars in the basket as she's trying to check out and she's trying to get home, get dinner ready, it's five o'clock, put those back. We're not gonna have any sweets before dinner. I have to get home, I have to cook, you're not helping. You're not listening to me. And pretty soon she gives up or she's checked out. But if you really want to know what she thinks, you follow her a little bit to the car or the subway stop and you'll hear something like, you are not coming with me again. I can't stand when you embarrass me in public. Um, it's a relational, it's a, it's, a, it's a moment in which the relationship has gone cold. You and I are not friends at this moment. <clears throat> and our friendship depends on your listening to me. Our relationship will work much better if you listen to me. Very important, very important message. Father, you know, they send people to jail for that around here. Put it back. <laughs> and there's no point following him out the store because that's all he's going to say. <laughs> and he's beginning to define his interaction as I want you to listen to me because you're going to have to get ready for a world beyond mom. And mom is teaching you about her part of the world. I have a world that I want you to know about too that's beyond her. And it doesn't work quite the way she thinks it does. So you better listen to your dad. You and I will always be buddies or friends. <clears throat> that's your mom's territory. I don't use that trick. I use another trick. Frustration tolerance versus facilitating. You've all seen this happen. Why don't you just tie his shoes for him? He's got to get ready to go to school. Well, they're not going to do it for him when he goes to college. He's going to have to learn it now. I know, but we're going to be late. And he's upset. Can't you just do it for him? No, I think this is an important thing for him to learn. Mothers get frustrated. Kids get frustrated. But the father will say, often, I am holding the ground against taking all these shortcuts because in the end, they're not going to work for him as well as you think. And so you'll, dads will often let frustration levels grow a little bit. And, um, and dads, by the way, are not as upset by things like temper tantrums and, um, uh, as, as, as moms are. They tend to take it much more to heart as a, as a failure in parenting. 
Respect versus gatekeeping, one of the classic differences between the way mothers and fathers behave comes after divorce. If a father has sole custody of his child, uh, for whatever reason, he is nine times, not two or three, nine times more likely to support an ongoing relationship with a mother than if the mother has sole custody. I want you to think about that. It's interesting. <laughs>